You guys just tell me when to go. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. I know this is a this is a little bit this one's a little bit out there for this uh, event, but. Um, I was asked to come in and, uh, well, I mean, I wasn't asked to. I kind of asked to come in and do this a, a, a while ago. Um, this, is, this is some work that I've been doing for quite a few years now, and I'll get into that just, in just a little bit. But, um, yeah, this is kind of an obscure, obscure topic, so I'm glad you guys are here. Um, but hopefully it's not so obscure that you won't be seeing a lot more of this coming down the pipes in the future. So um, what I'm going to talk about today real quick, just for a little bit here, is uh, Amazonics. Um, well, how many people out of... 10. How many people have actually experienced any Amazonic material? Okay. Yeah. A little, little bit. Okay. How about, how, has anybody heard of Amazonics? <laughs> okay. So um, I, I just want to give a little bit of background on this because I think it's important. Um, I, I, this is something that's uh, starting to show up in a lot of different places but maybe not the most obvious of places. Um, oh, I guess I should just introduce myself. My name is Jeff Merkel. Um, I teach uh, at the University of Colorado Denver here. I run the, I'm program director for the recording arts program and audio production, so uh, I do a lot of teaching. Um, I also teach a little bit down at DU in emergent digital practices. Um, but then I also have run, I've been a mastering studio for most of my career, I guess for probably on the order of almost 20 years now. I've been a mastering engineer. I've run a bunch of recording studios, um, and uh, yeah, I, but I also do some loudspeaker manufacturing, but most of my work these days is in teaching and also in research. Um, specifically, I'm doing a lot more in spatial audio. So um, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give a little more background as, as, as to my story as why I'm into this stuff, but um, Amazonics is, has been around for a really long time, so this is a pretty, pretty cool setup at um, DTF in, in Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen. It's a bunch of KEF speakers there set up in a crazy huge array. Um, I've never been in a room like this, but this is an Amazonic rig that uh, allows you to do spatial audio and 3D audio. Um, I got into spatial audio a while back. Like about, I've been working in spatial audio for about eight years now, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, we were, we, it started at Gates Planets here in, here in Denver, um, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We, they have, at, at Gates, they have a 15.1 hemispherical. So this is a little bit tough to see, but, and you could look at it either in, in, in either looking from behind or from, from in front. But they have a, about a, a, a large hemispherical dome that's on a 30 degree tilt. And inside that, they have a 15.1 uh, speaker array system. And we were brought in, and this is back in uh, probably 06. We were brought in to look at how to create, how, how to share content between planetariums. So planetariums are a unique environment in that they don't have any standards like st like cinema. So if you go to, into any any, any uh, standard movie theater, they're going to have a standard speaker arrangement. So that means that when people are creating con the content creators are creating for that, they can set up their studios so that you can hit create a defined experience, and then. Going a step further, if we do this for home theater, they can set it up either in stereo, which, I mean, uh, for, for, for film isn't quite such a big deal, but um, for doing, doing stereo, but for doing things like 5.1, 7.1, and the different surround formats, they, 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 they come up with standards. When I say they, I mean the particular companies behind this, either be it Dolby or Sony, they come up with standards on how they want the speakers to be arranged. Again, so the content creators know how that that they can set up their studios for content creation and that it'll be played back in the same manner. So if you want to work in surround and you want to have something fly by or through around or through, that they know that the channel order and the channel arrangement are going to be such that, that it will line up so that basically the content creation will work for the playback system. And that's great. But, um, and then it, it, taking a step further, now we have the same thing for at, at home, at, for home theaters. So um, we know that if we have a 5-1, that typically we have three speakers in front, two in the back, or to the si back sides, and you have a, a subwoofer. And we know the channel order to be in, like, it goes left, right, center, sub, LFE, or sorry, uh, left, right, center, sub, left surround, right surround. So that we know that when, I, when, when, when your playback system plays, it's going to be represented correctly on, uh, during playback. 
The thing is, planetariums don't have such a thing. So Gates Planetarium here is a 15.1. So if the people create content for that, they have to mix specifically for that auditorium. And then if they take to somewhere else, and some other auditorium has, um, say, a 12.2, or in some other kind of configuration. So that creates a real problem, because now all of a sudden you have to spend a lot of time remixing every single production for every single environment. And that's really expensive, time consuming, and difficult. And also, as a, as, as a producer of the film, or the content, or the music, or whatever, you have a difficult time controlling the experience as it moves around. So we were brought in to investigate how can we make, stuff, how can we make audio portable? In other words, how can we make this audio, this, how do we make audio separate or decouple it from the playback system? So our mix is decoupled from the playback system. And this is, this is the key thing. This is one of the things, the key things I want you to, to take away from uh, the, this talk today is uh, that, that key component, that understanding there, that you're taking away the playback mix from the playback system. They're completely separate from one another. And, the, the, and we looked at a lot of different methods for doing this, and, the, and we came up with Ambisonics. And so we, we were like, and this is, again, this is like an 06. And we're like, oh, Ambisonics is it. This is the coolest thing ever. And about that time at AES, we started seeing like little grumblings of it. You hear about, hear about it at talks, people investigating HOA, high order Ambisonics. And you see those kind of labs, these really cool, like spaceship looking labs that are doing really innovative work. But the problem was that, again, it was, it was always this kind of weird abstract thing that was kind of far away. So we, were, we, so we, got on the, we jumped on the Ambisonics bandwagon pretty early. And when I say we, um, it, was, it was my colleagues and, and I at, at CU, but we also have now uh, an artist collective called Signal to Noise Media Labs, where we research and design based on this, kind of, this, this content. Um, so we, again, so we brought it in there, and, and we were like, yes, this is the coolest thing ever. We wrote a paper on it, and it just kind of went into the archives, and nobody ever heard about it again, but, um, such as academia is sometimes. But um, the, the, the challenge, but then over time, it was just kind of this, we were beating this drum for a long time. We have actually st still are working in Gates Planetarium. We meet there every Tuesday night, and we just hack the system. So quite a few years, a few years after that, we went in and we're like, hey, can we uh, put on a show? Since we've done all this research in the planetarium, we're like, hey, can we put on a show in here? And they're like, sure. Uh, here, here's keys to the place. Literally gave us keys to the place to Gates Planetarium, which is a f super fun place to play. And we're, we walk in, we're like, okay, cool. So we had licked this whole problem of like making contact portable between systems, but we couldn't figure out. We're like, well, how do I make sound move around the dome? And they're like, I don't know. You figure it out. That's what you. <laughs> that's what you guys do. So we spent. Uh, this, so we spent about. Um, so instead of becoming content creators, we spent about four years becoming developers and starting to figure out how to make this technology happen. So that we and, and through that. And so this was uh, quite a few years ago. But we st we started making this happen, and, and we pretty much have the system licked. And so I'll show off some of the stuff that we've got going on here in a minute. But um, since then, what I've done is I've I've. Uh, and while the dome is really fun, it's also a limited experience. So we wanted to take this, this system, this, this notion of Amazonics out and show more people what you can do with it. So two years ago, I got a grant from Apogea, which is the Colorado Burning Man uh, group. And I got a, a grant to build a 16.1 on towers, an outdoor rig. And this is actually, if you've been up to my room, up in room 2030, this is what I'm showing uh, here at the show this, today. Um, I've only got the small scale version of it. I'm only showing an 8.1, but normally it's a, actually I should, I should have brought pictures of that. Uh, it's a 16.4 uh, and it's all solar powered. So we can bring it around and we basically are teaching people how to create sound for, for or we're doing live performance with, with 3D audio. So we're doing a lot of DJ work, but we're doing things like um, guided meditation and yoga sessions to uh, like raves to um, the interactive theater to classical recordings to uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. So that's kind of what, what I've been doing. And so I spent my last three months in tents going around the state, um, setting this thing up all over the place. So we set it up last week yeah, in Salida for a, for a yoga festival. And next week, we're setting up down the street uh, for a Meow Wolf event doing uh, spatial audio. And it's, 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 it's pretty trippy and pretty fun. So that's what I've been. So my, my personal um, aim has been how do we use, how do we use 3D audio for live performance. And uh, that's a pretty unusual thing. There's, not, there's a couple groups, other groups doing this, but it's pretty unusual. Most people, and, and I would say by and large the people that are at this, at this uh, fest, are going to be like, how do I use this stuff at home? How do I get my hands on this and how do I work with this stuff? What is it? And so that's what I want to talk about. So I'm not going to go into too deep on, on what this stuff uh, like all the nitty gritty math or any of that kind of stuff. While I think it's fascinating, it's probably not good for a one hour lecture. Um, so I think what we want to do is, the, the goal for today is just to get an understanding of what this stuff is, 
and, and where you can find it and then how you're going to be interacting with it. Because you will, even if you don't see it named Ambisonics written in big letters, it's going to be under the hood with a lot of the stuff that you'll be dealing with. Everything from cinema to, to, to a lot of the surround recordings that are being done now to uh, we're just this whole notion of this term immersive. Immersive media is just, it's everywhere now. And, and the reason is because of the rise of VR. VR, AR, um, and 360 video. That's what's really pushing the market right now. And that's why we're seeing a ton of innovation in this, realm, in this world. So, and it's going to bleed over and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cross over into the, our hi-fi world. And we're going to start seeing it all over the place. But um, it's, it, if, you, if you haven't really experienced it yet, it's on its way. So let's, this is a really crap, I hate these slides, by the way. I apologize. <laughs> these are like, nobody likes to read. I like picture slides. <laughs> so, but I wanted to have something up there for reference. Um, I like, I tried porting over one of my lectures for this and it wasn't working, so I rewrote these and I'm pretty unhappy with them, but you'll get the idea. So I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase here, but because nobody, what, what I hate is when people sit there and they read what they're, what's on the board, they're like, I can read that too. But essentially what we, what we if we want to talk about what Amazonics is, we can think about sound as a wave field, a three-dimensional wave field. So there's sound happening in here. You're experiencing the sounds passing through the air and you're picking it up in your two ears. And through that, you're able to cre create a three-dimensional audio experience. And the way you do that is some really complicated, what we call head-related transfer functions that allow you to localize sound in three-dimensional space. But the cool thing is you're able to, you're able to identify and, and, and work with 3D audio with only two ears. That's pretty cool stuff. So there's a lot of like biology, psychoacoustics, and stuff that are going on to make, to make this all happen. But the idea is that we have this wave field that's occurring to us. So the big brains that invented Amazonics, and this is how, so Amazonics has been around since about the 70s. It's early 70s technology that was um, developed mostly in Britain, and the Brits are still pretty much the, the ones that are kind of leading the game on this. But it was developed in the, in the late 70s, but it didn't really come into its own until recently with, with the rise of VR and AR. And now we're starting to see it everywhere. But um, it was, it was we, and also there, it, was, it was, you know, back in the 70s, everything was fairly analog. So it was a very difficult format to work with. So it was very mathy and very theoretical until recently when we've had enough computers and CPU to actually drive the systems that we want to work with Amazonics. So it's kind of been this just like, Development. So now we're at the stage in terms of technology and, and CPU power and, and, and uh, consumer uptake that we're able to actually see this stuff being used in, 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 in the market. But the idea here, again, is that we've got this three-dimensional wave field. So the idea is how do we record this three-dimensional wave field? So I want to record three-dimensional audio. And that, was, that, that at the outset is how it was done. Or that, that's, that's the goal at the outset. And again, um, a, couple of the, a few of the big brains back in the day figured out the math behind this stuff. And let's see, how did I say it? Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take a sound. And if you imagine a sound of where it's coming from, is essentially like a vector and an amplitude. And so we can, by using, by manipulating phase and phase, I guess, or, and or polarity and amplitude with different polar patterns will allow us to record this, this, this 3D audio wave field with using standard audio channels. And it's, it's a little deceptive when you start working with Amazonics out of the gates. And most, most people, when you're, when you're working at, at, at like the, not in a studio, you don't tend to think about what audio channel is doing what in what stream, typically. But um, it's, it, it does get a little bit, and I've got some cool pictures here to show, it, show what's happening with the audio, with, with the polar patterns here. But basically, these, these systems, something like this, and I'll talk about this mic here in just a minute, has the ability to capture a three-dimensional wave field. And what it's going to do is it's, it's, this has four diaphragms on it, so it's captured, it uses four channels. So the, 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 the idea is that we are able to recreate or capture the, a 3D audio wave field using four, only four channels right there. It's kind of odd. I'll talk, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. But then, so that's how we encode it. We could also synthesize it so by using software. I can, I can place a sound in three-dimensional space wherever I want to place that. And I can and and that can I can create the, the the resultant audio files that would come out of that. And then that's the coding side. And then we have the decoding side, is the playback system. So the playback system that is how do we actually hear the how do we recreate this three dimensional wave field using a number of speakers? And this is where again where I think the cool the magic and the coolest part about Amazonics is is that you can think about these these speakers set about your space, and well, I'll talk about headphones later, but we'll talk, start with speakers. So if you set up speakers, speakers act as windows into this three-dimensional wave field. So in other words, if I have more speakers, I have more resolution. 
So if I, don't have, if, I, if I have speakers set up, say, like in a 5-1 arrangement, and if I have an airplane flying overhead, it doesn't do a very good job of representing an airplane flying overhead because I have everything on a flat plane. But if I throw an overhead speaker, if you're dealing with a higher, higher channel count immersive systems, you can make stuff fly over the top of you, and you're like, oh, because I have speakers up there, now I have the ability to, to resolve sounds coming from above. And same thing happens with the three-dimensional audio wave field. So if I add more speakers, I have more resolution. So the cool thing here, though, is that the three-dimensional wave field exists whether I have speakers there or not. The speakers are there just to act as windows into this other, into this other virtual world, so to speak. So the cool thing is it doesn't matter if I'm working on a, a stereo system, a 5.1 system, a 50.1, a 500-channel system, it's all the same audio stream. It's just a matter of where you have the speakers in there. So your decoder has to know where those speakers are in 3D space and a few things about them. But as long as you know where they are in 3D space, you can represent the, the you can recreate this three-dimensional, you create these windows into this three-dimensional wave field. It's pretty pretty cool stuff. So, um, what we well, oh, yeah, I'm sorry about the texty slides. <laughs> I, I, I have more pictures coming up soon. So when we talk about ambisonics, though, we have, we have different levels. And this is, this, these are kind of the things I want you to kind of take away. Because when you're talking about ambisonics, we're talking about in terms of first order, second order, third order. And what those refer to is the number of channels that they're using and the polar patterns. I've, the next couple slides, I have some pictures of this. But first order, so in this case right here, I have four, cha I have four channels of audio. This is a four channel recorder right here. It's going to give me what we call first order ambisonics. So that's the lowest order of ambisonics that we deal with. And then the second, the second order, if I want to jump to the next order of resolution, I'll use nine channels. And then third order is going to be 16 channels. You can keep going all the way up to 11th order. I think 11th order uses something like 256 channels of audio to do this. Um, it'll, it'll come clear. I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute. But um, the point here is that the more channels I use, they determine the resolution, the directivity. So if I want something to sound very small, so like for instance, I've got these two stereo speakers set up on, uh, on my left and right. If I want something to pan slowly between the two of these right here, we use uh, a phantom image. So if I, if I have something, to si say, the size of my fist right here, if I want this to move back and forth between the two of these, it doesn't work very well because they're very, very far apart. If I put a lot more speakers across this, this front here, uh, or I guess the idea is that if I, if I want to use these two stereo speakers, I want to pan back and forth between the two of these, your image is going to be fairly large, your, your, your directivity of that, of that sound object, so to speak. And so we, a lot of this we call object-based mixing. We, use, we describe sound, sounds as objects in 3D space. So you'd imagine like a little, like if my hand was like a little ball that was beeping. If I want that to come from this speaker over to that speaker, if I want it to feel very, 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 very sharp, if you're sitting dead center, you can use the phantom image to create that effect. But if anybody else is in the space, it's going to be off-centered. You're going to get the Haas effect and precedence effect and all this kind of bad things. It gets smeared and your, your stereo doesn't work very well. So by adding another, another, another speaker in the middle would allow me to get a sharper resolution, a better panning, smoother panning across the two of them. So the idea is if I want to make an object, sound object sound small, in other words, if I want something to sound like it's a real, like it's right there. I want it to, I want it to smell like, sound like it's a small object flying around. I need a lot of speakers because I need it to fill in between those to, to that space. If I go to a lower lower order, these lower order ones, it's going to sound very diffuse. So if I were having say some like uh, some dialogue or some some uh, a violinist off to the left, I'd be like, okay, that violinist is kind of over there. But I can't really tell. It's just kind of this cloudy, this fuzzy of like, yeah, I've got them coming from over there, but I can't say it's right there. So the cool thing is if we go up in, up in order, it gives us sharper, sharper, sharper images. So the, the, the more channels we have, the, the ability to give us more resolution and more definition of those sound objects. But the catch is to make that work, to make that magic trick work, you need more speakers. So while I can sit there, I can play back an Amazonic play, uh, Amazonic channel or Amazonic recording on a mono, it will work. But of course, well, with a mono, you will have no, no sense of immersion or, or, or anything. But if I go up to a quad, a quad, a four channel system, like, a, like four speakers, it will work. But it's not going to be very, very resolved, especially in the height. I won't have any height channel. So I can't tell if something's high or something's low. It won't really resolve very well. So there, there's kind of a trade off there. So right now, third order Amazonic teams, well, most, most stuff that we're, here, we're seeing in commercial world, like in VR, 
AR and, that, and even the video gamer world, we're seeing stuff in the first and sometimes in the second order. FE 360, um, which if you, if, if you spend any time on Facebook and done any of those 360 videos where you look around, especially if you put on headphones, it does, hire, it does amisonics to binaural and you can pan around. And I, uh, FE 360 right now is running on second order amisonics. Um, but um, yeah, I guess that's, 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 what, that's kind of the, the, in, a, in a nutshell the way that works. So I just want, again, the takeaway for, for this one was that we have for, like our, what we call first, second, third. And again, we can go up to 11th order, but that's kind of laboratory conditions. You don't really use, uh, most people don't use above third order, typically. It does exist. Uh, but in, in, in like real world applications, we don't see th third order amisonics happening very much. Now it's important, to, so what we call this, all these things is the, 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 the most normal ambisonics that we use is what we call B format. So that's, that's another term that the, the, some lingo that you may see come through uh, through whatever media. But it's called B format. So the B format refers to all the different polarity patterns of all, of all the, the lobes, the, what we call spherical harmonics. Um, yeah, that's the next slide. Um, but this is because, in the, with, with what I love about this, I'm a big open source advocate. I love the idea of sharing information. So the, again, this was developed in the 70s, and it was developed as a theoretical model with a bunch of math, but they just gave it to the world. They're like, cool, have fun with this, see what you can do. And it still exists in this form today. So because of this, it's still considered an open source format. And for that reason, there's, there's not a lot of like hardcore standards. There's people that come up with best practices so that we can agree upon. There's no, there's no company behind this that says, this is the way this is, like something like Dolby Atmos. So the, the, on this one, uh, with this one, they're like, well, this is what we think is the best. But there's always a few outliers that are like, no, we think we're going to go this way. Or they're going to fork it and go, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to do it. And that's totally cool. But um, it's, and that's, I think, what keeps the innovation happening, but also makes it very difficult to transfer uh, content when people don't play on the same playing field, when people have different rules. So um, there's, it's not, there's not a lot of this going on. So the classic one, it's called First Malum. Uh, FUMA was the one that's been around for a long time. They developed, and it has to do with the channel ordering, and then uh, our AmbiX is the newest, newer one. And so most people and most companies are using AmbiX now. Um, you're starting to see this used everything in VR. Like I'm, some people, some people are showing me even their phones have now 360 capability of recording audio, and I'm sure and they're recording it in AmbiX uh, convention. So um, what did I say about that? Yep. That's all there really is I wanted to say about that. But it's just cool to know that there is, the, the, the term here that I want to take away from this is what we call B format. So this is what I wanted to talk about for a minute. So this is the polar patterns of the microphones that I was talking about for a minute. So when we talk about, I'll say, well, we'll talk about a microphone for, for a moment. So a microphone, if you take an omnidirectional microphone, it creates up what we call up there, it's an omnidirectional polar pattern. It picks up everything in every direction at equal amplitude. And then um, if we move to a figure eight uh, microphone down here, we see that they have a black and a, and a node. So in other words, what it does is this one right here, for instance, and we can define it however we want. We'll call that Z, that X, and that Y. That this is going to be recording in the Y axis, and it has a node on the X and the Z axis. So therefore, and, and, and not only that, is on the positive Y and on the negative Y have opposite phase or polarity. So therefore, it's going to, rec it's, it's going to record the sound in the front or in the back, but with opposite polarity. Well, we make, we make figure eight microphones. And there's, that's, a, that's a, something that's used quite a bit in the studio and in the field. And, a figure, and essentially what we're doing here is we're essentially setting up four microphones. One microphone that picks up the X, one that picks up the, Z, the Y, and one that picks up the Z. And then we have the top one, which is what we call the W. The W, we can, we can, we can say, is magnitude. Or we could also equate that to distance. So the cool thing is if I sum all four of these together, it's going to give me a, 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 a vector. Well, it's going to give me an azimuth elevation and a distance. And in, in, in ambisonics lingo, that's usually how we define the, where something is coming from. So we have azimuth, elevation, and distance. So our azimuth and elevation are going to come from our polar patterns, are going to come from, from our x, our y, or z, and our w is going to give us how far away this thing is. So the cool thing is that's our four channels that we're using right there, x, y, z, and w. That's how we determine where something is coming from. And that should give us all the information that we need. And it does. So first order amisonics uses the zeroth and the first order. So we're going to use all four of those channels right there. Second order goes a step further, and it's going to add five more channels with some 
these make sense? This one's like, huh, okay, <laughs> that's a little weird, but, um, and, and, and if, if this isn't sinking in, don't worry about it. It took me a while to kind of like really kind of internalize how this stuff works. Um, but basically, these are, and, and using like mathematical transforms, are able to determine how, what the polarity is of these. So if I sum all of these nine together, it gives me higher resolution, like what I was talking about. It gives me more resolution, more definition in terms of directionality and where that's coming from. And then if I go to third order, it's going to use all 16 of these at one time to give us better resolution in terms of where something is coming from. Again, it's a little odd to me. That, like, a lot of these make sense. It's these two that I think are a little bit funky. And I don't know why, how those ones came about. That's, again, for the mathematicians to understand that one. But um, this is, this, again, it's just using polar patterns of, of signals to create these. So if I soloed out one channel and I listened to this one right here, you can be like, yeah, it just sounds like sound. It just sounds like whatever, music. If I, if, I, if I set this up in front of a violinist and I play that back and I soloed out one of those channels right there, it's just going to sound like music. But because what, what we can't do is we can't hear the relative phase and, and, and amplitude relative to the other ones to give us this, this sense of direction. I know that's confusing, but is there any questions on this? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. In terms of those black and white balls or whatnot, can you give, a, can you give me hmm? any sort of reference point in terms of sounds? Are you talking about different frequencies? Are you talking about nope. different phase? We what? are talking about phase. Yeah, we're not talking about frequency. So imagine, imagine um, using our, our, our X, Y, and our Z right here. If I have a sound coming in front, coming in front of me, it's, it's going to hit. It's going to hit this microphone, or well, we'll also, I'll call it microphones. Um, it'll, it'll hit this because I'm using that term loosely because it, it, it's, it's not actually recording it in that fashion. We turn it into this. But we'll just, just assume that it's coming from this direction. So it's going to hit this lobe. So these are called lobes. So it's going to hit, like if it comes from this front, it's going to hit this lobe right here. And it's going to hit that other lobe with opposite phase. And it's not really going to hit this one. It's not really going to hit this one because these are, we can think of these lobes as ter in terms of sensitivity. That's showing how well they pick up in each how well they pick up in each direction. So in this case, if a sound is coming in directly from here, it's not going to hit this one. It's not going to hit this one, and, but it will hit this one and that one. And the summing of those two will give the appearance of that it's coming from the front, or that will give me the, 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 the if I add all those together, it gives me the the direction of it coming from the front. If it's coming from behind, the sum of all of those. Will give the will will give the, the will create the wave field coming from behind. I, I'm using that wave field a little incorrectly right there, but um, it'll it'll give it the sound source coming from behind from from behind me. So um, yeah, I know I don't want to go. I don't want, like. No, just keep going. Thank no, you. No, no. I appreciate that. I got a million other questions, and I'm just gonna let you. Maybe go. Thank okay. You. Let's 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 come back. Let's see if it. Let's let's keep keep trucking to see if it if it if 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 it if it. Uh, a answers itself here in a, in a couple minutes, but I'll, if it doesn't, let's let's return to that because I want to because I, I do want to make sure that we hit that. Okay, let's do this. So let's talk about like how we actually do the encoding of this thing. So if I want to create some, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go blast through this pretty quick. For me, this is where I spend most of my time because uh, I'm a content creator, I'm a producer. This is where I spend my time. Um, some of my students here, I can see that they're, they're in that same field too. But um, for the most part, what we see, especially at a festival like this, is how, I want to see how, I, how, I, how do I play this back, how do I listen to this stuff. But I think it's worth understanding how this thing works. So I can record this stuff. So a few, a few manufacturers now making Amazonic mics. It used to be a really underground format. And now, like with Sennheiser just getting into the game, and a couple other, like Rode just came out with one. Um, they used to be very, very, very expensive mics and very boutique and custom kind of things, but now we're starting to see this. Is, um, we're starting to see some of the big players get into the game. So this is called the Sennheiser Ambio, but um, there's a company, Soundfield, that's been doing it for a really long time. They make fantastic mics, but they're really expensive, so they're they're pretty out of their out of the range. So this is about a $1,600 mic. Uh, Rhodes just came. The the Rode mic just came out for $1,000, and so these are first order um, field recording mics, and so they but. Here's the tricky part, is they actually record in what we call A format. So it's a tetrahedral 
position, so it's not the same as what we were just looking at. It's a tetrahedral that we have to convert into, into B format. We start with A format and turn it into B format. So it's a little weird. So we use the, the DSP software to do that. Um, but now we're starting to see some, some again, some really, some really innovative folks are coming up now. We're starting to see second order mics, and I think I even saw a third order microphone coming out that are gonna give you really, really good high order, uh, good, great directivity. So it's starting to happen there. Um, so in the way we would do, let me pull this up. Um, oh, I guess th this one really locks me down. I can't, I'll have to escape out of my, my presentation. But um, what we can do is we can convert from uh, from A format to B format. And I'll show, I'll show some software how to do this in a minute. The other one is if we want to synthesize this. So this is what I'm doing upstairs in my room. So we have the ability to uh, move sound, sound objects around the 3D space. So this is how it's done in cinema most of the time. So you'll, um, if, you, if you're doing mixing for a film that you want to have um, so a, a, like a, a, a rocket fly by or something like that, or a spaceship flying by, that basically what you do is you imagine your sound as an object. So this is, this is using Nuendo right here. This is kind of an odd, odd one. But basically, it shows you your, your screen right there. And you have these little objects. And you can grab them. And you can move them around in 3D space. And it creates, those, it creates the, the resultant wave field that allows it to be played back on any system. So we can actually grab these things and pan these around. So here's, um, I'm going to have to escape out of this for a moment. So I can show this. So this is um, this is just Ableton Live. This is just music production software. But in this, um, well, let's talk this one right here. Mm. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So this is using some software to convert from A format using the microphone, and I can convert it down to B format. I want to, or I can, and here's the, some of the fun stuff, is I can make it go to 5.1. I can make it go to 7.1. I can adjust where I want those virtuals, so I can rotate the entire image around, or I can rotate the entire image around. I can adjust the width and the let. So you can do this all in play. So with one recording, you can actually mix it down to 5.1, to 7.1, to anything you want it to. So again, this is the beauty of it being completely formalist. Where did you get the, that plugin? It's free from Soundfield. It's amazing, right. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, so it's it's a it's a neat neat piece of software. Um, that this one that came with, oh, this one is this is the Rode one that just came out. Um, it's the same. It does the same thing. So it takes in uh, like AMBX. Uh, they're doing uh, yeah. So it's a format, and I can kick out to five one stereo mono. 7.1, 5.1.2, 7.1.2, 5.1.4. So, the, so when we see the, five, the designations for like 7.1, or this one, 5.1.4, it means I have five on this plane and I have four overheads in there. So, and I can adjust where I want those to look at. It's hard to, kind of hard to tell, but these, uh, the blues, these are, these are up high and the oranges are up high. So I can adjust, and so I, if I want to play back something recorded this on a 5.1 rig, I can. If I want to play it back on a 7.1 rig, cool. If I want to play it back on a 500 channel rig, they don't have a preset for that, but you can certainly do that. Um, and then uh, last one I think is this one. Where'd it go? Oops, not that one. Last one in line. So this is uh, the Ambio. What it does is it says, okay, I want to convert from A format to B format. That's this microphone right here. And I can tell it which direction the microphone was originally set up. And I can, re, I can, I can change the orientation and rotation of it in post-production. It's really crazy. For me, it's mind-blowing kind of stuff. It's pretty neat. So it allows you to, with one microphone, you can change all your stuff in post-production. It's like being able to, which now they have the light field cameras to do something like this. It allows you to take a, 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 an acoustic snapshot and then change the microphone, or like it's like taking taking a, a shot on a, on a video camera, and then deciding that I want to take something over here, it, then then instead of this one, or I want to focus separately in a different way than I had done during the actual recording. So it's pretty cool, um, pretty neat stuff. So then this is what we do. This is um, let's see, I'll zoom in a little bit. So this is the three-dimensional panners that we make. So instead of recording it, we synthesize it. So I can make 
in this case, I'm working on a half on a on a hemisphere right here. So I have the ability to move the sound wherever I want to in 3D space. Now I have it stitched to the sphere right here, but I have the I, I can move it through the space as well. But just for for my software in terms of ease of simplicity, this is what I wrote for 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 DJs to work with. That I can now a DJ in, sitting in the sphere can go. I want I want the kick to be there. I want the snare to be there. I want that to be there. And they can recreate however they want to do that. They can position where they want the sound to come from. In, at any time. So again, if you want to come see this, this is what we're, we're playing with upstairs in, uh, the, uh, in the room up there, uh, 3020. Um, so again, we have the ability to synthesize or record, or we could do a hybrid approach. So this is what we're going to see. Um, I, I, I imagine what we would find most of happening for this type, type of a scene, where we would sit up, if we were recording, say, a quintet. Or actually, let's talk, let's, let's go bigger. Let's require, re, re, record a, a, a full orchestra. Usually what you're going to do, in traditional sense, when we record orchestras, we're going to do a space pair, or a, a stereo pair, high up above conductor, or, or, or full, pull back a little bit to get the overall feel. But then oftentimes, we'll set up spot mics uh, throughout the orchestra to give them, if we have a soloist, for instance, and that, solo needs, that soloist doesn't stand out in the mix as much as we think it should, we'll bump them up just a little bit and so we can give them a little bit more, up, a little more presence. Well, the same thing would happen here. We would set up the sound. We would set up this mic right here, and then what we would do is we would set up spot mics on specific instruments. Or if you have like uh, like a choir, you might have a soloist. You would set up a mic on that soloist, so you could actually pull them up in the mix a little bit later. So a hybrid approach is where you're going to use primarily this as the as the backdrop for your spatial mix, but then you can also influence and place things in 3D space where you want to have additional components on top of that. So, the, so let's talk about decoding. So that, so that encoding part again is a little bit, is probably a little bit removed from 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 this kind of uh, fest. But I think it's important to understand just kind of the, what's what's going on there. Decoding is what we care about here. How do I listen to this stuff? Or even even more, where do I even find this material? So. Um, again, it, a lot of times it's you don't go well. You can, and actually, people have bought Ambisonic recordings. And so, what, we're, what I'm hoping we're going to start seeing more is straight up pure Ambisonic recordings that you can just download and play back. Um, but usually, right now, they're kind of hidden inside of things like Facebook 360, inside of YouTube streams. They're hidden. They're inside of video streams. That's where we're seeing most of the delivery content nowadays. But you can find it in other ways. But Again, the important thing here to remember is that it's a single audio stream, and the playback system is, is independent. So whether I'm listening to it on binaural headphones with tracking, a high channel count system like a, we'll say a 7.1.4, um, or, or 5.1.7.1 or surround standard setup, like a home theater type setup, or even just going to, to, to stereo, all of these are going to use the same audio stream. And this is from, for, from content creation. This makes things really easy, uh, not easy but much more controlled. So I don't have to do a separate mix for every single one of these. Uh, since you're mentioning the 7.1.4, I just want to make sure I'm understanding something. You mentioned Dolby Atmos earlier. Yeah. Uh, was Dolby Atmos different, totally different? Or no, it actually, it's not. Or is this licensed? So, so Dolby Atmos, what they did is they basically, and they, do, they don't reveal all of their magic that they do under the hood, but it's very much the same, the same system. It's essentially, um, the way, Dolby basically commercialized the technology, and more power to them. I'm not knocking that. I think it's, it's cool that they did this. This is how they're bringing it to the market. But what they did is they take, they take Amazonics. They may have done a couple of tweaks to it behind the scenes, and then what they do is they, they make it so they have a very controlled, um, playback stream so that they, they control the hardware and the playback system so that you can get a very controlled experience. But under the hood, it's actually pretty much like Amazonics. But, um, but again, they, they throw their own like, you know, proprietary hardware and, and file types on there so that basically they can control it. Again, if you're running, a, if you're running an auditorium with 30 shows a day, you want to have make sure that you have customer support and that, you're, that you're, you'll pay the money because you want this thing to work. The way the, the world I work in is very like, make it up and make it your own and stuff, which is cool. But like nobody wants like nobody wants to sit there trying before every movie going like oh, I don't know why it's not working. And so I mean if you've been upstairs in my room, we spend a lot of time going I don't know, figure it out. <laughs> so so um, I'm so more proud to him. Same thing with DTSX. So the way so the thing is though, Dol and, and which which is a little bit surprising to me. So Dolby Atmos they define where your speakers are, and that's what that's what I think is kind of 
I, I dislike about that system is that the whole point of this spatial rig is that you can put the speakers wherever you want. As long as you know where they are in 3D space, you can put them pretty much wherever you want. They're supposed to be on a hemisphere and equidistant from one another, but in real world, I mean, if, you have a, if, if anybody has a 5.1, finding people that have real 5.1 set up to the actual surround specs is really rare. So what I like about this, this kind of setup is it allows you to get into the surround game and you can play as much, get it in deep as, as you want or as shallow as you want. You could put, say, I want to buy more speakers but less expensive or I want to buy fewer speakers but make them more expensive or you know, however you want to allocate your resources that, allow, that allows a lot more flexibility. But Atmos plays well in this scene. So in other words, if you have an Atmos rig that you could play this back on, again, it won't decode for you. So uh, Atmos won't decode native Ambisonic type material because they, Dolby has their their uh, you know IP to protect, so um, but it, it can like if I if I want to play back on a 7.1.4 rig I could do that if I have access to those speakers that's the game here and I'll talk about that in a minute it's like the challenge is how do we actually consume this stuff and and the the answer is there's no real simple answer right now there's no commercial there's no commercial Amazonic decoders for hi-fi that's because. Nobody wants to spend a ton of money making this thing that's an open standard that you never know if it's going to work or not. So that's why we stick with DTS-X. So DTS-X is really cool. It's a, it's a very similar concept, but they allow for much more flexible speaker configurations. Um, and then there's Oro 3D has, has defined speaker configurations, but um, same idea. You have like the height channels and sometimes the lower channels as well. Um, so yeah, how do, we, how do we actually hear this stuff? So we can hear it back on speakers. So there's not much in the con yeah, consumer since there's no, there's no commercial decoders for this thing. So you won't find an Amazonic decoder out on the floor here just because there is, so, so the weird thing is we're like, well, what is the like, file type for it? It's, it's just a dot .wave or dot .aif. They're just audio files. They can, and they can be um, any resolution. I mean, the higher the resolution, the better. But they can work in any resolution. So they're not a specific like, file extension. They're not a specific proprietary anything. It's just a four-channel interwoven wave, or a seven-channel interwoven wave, or a 16-channel, oh, sorry, nine-channel interwoven wave, or a 16-channel inter interwoven wave. And, that's, and that you bring that in, and you can dec decode that. But again, there are no decoders, commercial decoders, at least that I know of. If you know of one, let me know. But yeah. I think the is coming out with 16-channel Yes. Cool. Cool. Um, good to know. I, like, I, I, I'm excited for that. So uh, what we're seeing, though, um, but th the way you will consume this by, 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 by a landslide is through headphones. That's where all the action is right now. And, so, uh, in, and to do that, we add another layer of complexity by going to binaural. So we're going, H going uh, Amazonics to, uh, to binaural. And how many people have experience with binaural stuff? Yeah. So we've seen, we've seen binaural, and, and, and likely, um, it's, in the past, traditionally, it's been done with binaural recordings, where you take a dummy head, and you put the microphones on there, and you actually record binaural. And it's freaking convincing. I love it. I think it's amazing stuff. Um, but if we really want to dig down and make this stuff work really well, I mean, the best model head is your own head for this sort of thing. And so a lot of times when we set up like the Neumann dummy head, it to do the recordings, it does a pretty good job. And in fact, I'm surprised at how well it does for it being just like a, a dummy head that doesn't look like me at all. So, I mean, it resembles me, you know, compared to my dog. It looks more like, <laughs> it looks more like me than my dog, but it, it, it's, it's still, it still works pretty well. But again, that's a, static, that's a static binaural recording, meaning that if I'm wearing headphones and I've got the binaural playing, like if I'm listening to a, con a concert, and I'm like, oh yeah, I could hear the, per the person walking across in front of me. If I turn my head, the image moves with my head, right? And so that's, that's weird. So the cool thing is now with the rise of VR and head tracking is we, ha we now have the ability to do dynamic HRTF and keep that image right there. So in other words, if I have somebody talking right there and I turn my head, they stay in, right, in exactly the same spot. So while a lot of the horsepower, we're very visual beings, a lot of the horsepower in VR is going towards our visual systems. Um, there's a lot of actually cool work being done under the hood for in, in terms of the binaural type recording. And I think it, it, it unfortunately gets, doesn't get as much uh, fanfare as I think it should because there's a lot of really smart people working on this that are doing some really innovative work. Um, but what we're seeing, so, so things like on headphones and binaural, we'll see something on the Vive and the Oculus. Those are the two, the two you know, captains of VR right now, but there's a lot of other, other ones, uh, the Intel and all these other companies are in the game as well. 
HP, they all have their own, their own flavors of, of VR. Um, but, and, and with that, because they have head tracking, in the same way that if you were just wearing something there and you saw somebody, you know, my dog walking across the screen, and if I turn your head, it, you, want it to, you don't want it to stay with you. You want it to be like, uh, like you want it to stay, stay in a fixed spot. So the cool thing is now, with, again, with the high resolution, high frame rate head tracking, we're able to keep the images where they are. And the, the, the better um, head-related transfer function models, they, they're called SOFA models. There's a, there's, you can go actually get your head scanned, and you can create your own, your own HRTFs that are custom for you. In a lot of these systems, you can actually load in your own head into these models. We're going to see a lot more cool stuff coming down the pipes. I think, like, I, I would love to see if you were just to take, like, uh, photogrammetry, and just basically scan your face with a bunch of pictures, and then it creates a 3D model of your ears, of your earlobes, and create a very accurate HRTF. It's going to get cool. It's, this, is, this, is, this is where things are really uh, hot right now. We're seeing some cool stuff. But we're also seeing it in terms of 360 video. So if you go on YouTube right now, you can see a lot of it, and probably, or in Facebook. If you scroll down and you see a 360 video, that you, and if you're watching it on 360 or on Facebook, it's not a VR experience, but you can drink, use your mouse and you can drag it around and you can look in different ways. And if you have headphones on, the image will actually stay the same. So uh, both YouTube, Vimeo, or I guess YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, and Vimeo all have 360 uh, Amazonic capabilities built into their audio engines there. You have to set up your, your, your metadata in such a way. And the cool thing is a lot of cameras, consumer cameras, and even pro cameras now have the ability to record 360 audio built onto that 360 camera. I've done a few 360 video shoots, and I usually bring this rig right here. So the 360 camera sits up here. And if you're looking on the 360 camera and you look down, you'll see it. You know, it's just got a big old ball right there. It's like right below this, the camera. So it's not exactly inconspicuous, but, um, but it works really well. And you can do some really cool stuff. So now imagine, and that's where I think it kind of plays into this scene, is like where if I were able to get really high resolution, high quality recordings coupled with a VR experience, I think that's where things are going to get really fun for us. Like in this scene, for the, at the high level of doing beautiful recordings and beautiful performances that you can capture in, in, this, in this format that are, um, I don't know, I, th I just think that's going to be really fun to see. So again, you, like, just go look around on YouTube right now. So like, a lot of times if you're looking at YouTube, on your, even you can do it on your phone. If you're, if you're walking at YouTube, you can, you can scroll around. And they have some demos out there. I think they're a little corny, most of them. I haven't seen some really good ones. But where you're like, outside and you hear somebody talking, you can look around and the stream is like, running right here. And you're like, whoa. Even though you're not moving your head, you're just moving the video. But the video, the audio tracks with the video in, in a very convincing way. It's pretty, pretty cool. Video games, of course, big, big, big pusher of this, of this technology. We're starting to see a lot of video games there. But I was surprised, and also just in cinema. We're seeing a lot of this happening in cinema. So even though you're going to be pushing this to, say, um, like Atmos, an Atmos system, you'll still record in Amazonics. And then in and all of our Pro Tools rigs and that stuff, they have Amazonics capability. Even though you're delivering in, in Dolby Atmos format, you have the ability to record. So now you see almost every field recordist out there has an, like an Amazonic rig to, to record and capture that because of the flexibility. Because you can change your polar pattern, your directivity, and everything in post. It's, it's pretty cool. So we're seeing a lot more in cinema. But then, um, then even then, uh, uh, Ben and my buddy and I both got these uh, Audis, um, uh, Mobius headphones that just came out recently. They're, they're geared towards the gaming industry, but they're like VR, but for just headphones. And so they have, it's like VR, but without the visuals. So we have one up in the room if you want to come play with it. We're just kind of getting our hands, heads wrapped around it and how to make this thing work. But it's pretty neat. You hit the center button, and the audio image stays in one spot as you turn your head around. It, the, the, like if you have a drummer playing some, some, some congos in front of you right there, you're like, cool. Just close your eyes, but then they stay right there. Wow, that's cool. Other companies are coming now with trackers you just put on your own headphones. So you don't need to necessarily buy a branded headphones. You can just buy a, a head mount tracker and put it on any of the things, any of the headphones you find at CanJam. You put them on there. Um, I haven't seen any earbuds yet, but I bet you there's some out there that have them in there. I haven't seen it yet. Um, is your uh, live performance system available, or is, is that something? Yeah. Yeah, so, so he asked if, if my, uh, uh, they asked if my live performance uh, system was available. Yes, everything I do is open source. Everything I do is free. So I'm a service, not a product. <laughs> and so I'm an academic, so I don't sell anything. Well, I do sell speakers, but not, the, not this stuff. So yes. Um, where, could, where could you find that? Right now, you just get email me. I do have a GitHub, so you can download it. But it's my, I haven't updated it for a while. So you can just email me, and I can, I can get it to you. <laughs> um, cool. So. As high five people, how do we do this? 
how do we get into it? Well, it sounds like, did you say Emotiva is doing that? Cool. Cool. OK. Cool. So um, uh, again, this is I want like I, it, it's hard to call this stuff bleeding edge because it's been around since the '70s, <laughs> but it's now just like really becoming more commercial and more available. So I, I'm excited to see. So I think for us as hi-fi enthusiasts, where we're going to see this the most is in the innovation right now is in headphones, and that's where we're going to see a lot of it, just because it's by the nature of being pushed from other from other industries. But um, I, I think that we're I'm hoping that we're going to start to see some of this. So. Um, Ask your labels, ask your content creators to push, start putting out some Amazonic stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, especially, I mean, because the delivery methods, you can do something like YouTube. I know that YouTube, you know, for, for quality wise, isn't necessarily prime, but the reach is really good. Um, so, yeah, there's just not really any Amazonic commercial Amazonic decoder. So, we're just kind of, we're kind of, we're, we're, but that's just right now. Hopefully, we'll start to see things r rising up. Uh, there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of interesting, some startups. We're seeing both big captains of the industry and a lot of in innovative startups in this field. So, just keep your eyes out. But the keywords, you know, are B format, a high or, H HOA, higher order Amazonics. Um, yeah, so VR, AR. Um, if you haven't played with VR yet, it's, it's getting better and better and better. There's some pretty cool stuff you can do with it. So um, keep asking for more. Keep, keep, keep asking for more. Um, yeah, so I guess that's all I really had. So this is me. Um, I, like, if you want to come upstairs and play with anything, uh, we're in 2030. So I, right now, I have my rig set up as kind of a DJ rig. It's an outdoor rig that we have set up upstairs. But it's, it's a lot of fun. So. Um, yeah, you can hit me up anytime with any questions, any, any, anywhere. Like, uh, you know, I'm around. We're setting up a 20.2 system at school, I think, pretty soon. So we'll have a, a big immersive rig locally if you're in Denver that we'll be able to start doing some stuff on. Yeah. Oh. So one of the, in one of the earlier panels, there was a lot of talk about um, this, uh, how do we get multi-channel streaming going and how do we get past the bandwidth requirement of yeah. multi-channel streaming? Can this type of technology help with that? And instead of sending a multi-channel stream, you send an ambisonic stream that becomes multi-channel on the other end. Yeah, you, could, you certainly could do that. Uh, and, and so if you're going, especially if, if you want to do something in the order of um, like first order ambisonics, it's, it's a, it's a four-channel stream. It's not, it's still going to, especially if you're going with high resolution stuff, it's still going to be pretty high bandwidth requirements, but much less. But you can take that four-channel and, and decode that to a 50.1. And so you don't have to have 50 or you don't have to have 51 channels. You just need one, one four-channel audio stream, and you could you could do that. Of course, if you want to go higher resolution, you need to go to say second or third order, which is 16 channels, and then all of a sudden bandwidth requirements do become pretty tough. So um, you know, at current internet type stuff, that's that is going to be a pretty high barrier, at least in in our modern environment right now. So it's still going to have to be a download type of a thing. Uh, where or or something that you stream locally, you wouldn't probably stream from the internet. 16 channels, high resolution. Um, I mean, there are certain places you probably could do that, but probably by and large, I mean, third order is pretty high resolution. Second and first order is what we're seeing most of right now. Um, the Audi's headphones that we're talking about, those are all first order. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff out there that's happening in that. In that, but that's a good question. Nothing. Well, with, oh, yes. So, is it possible, do you think it will ever be possible to take a regular two-channel recording, somehow create a recording from that that you can then process into, because uh, you're saying, create new material. Is mm -hmm. there stuff out? That's my first question. The second is, who are some of the people from the 70s who are uh, innovative in this? Are you talking about like Eno and stuff like that? No, I'm talking about the, the developer, the, scienti the, 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 like the scientific developers behind this. I'm, I'm really weak on knowing who was actually using. Because I don't know how, I know that everything I've read and, and been involved with in terms of my, my research on this, most of my research is done in, the moder in, in modern stuff. I just, I, I know from, from just, Re reviewing that it comes from the 70s. Um, Herzog, 
and oh god, I can't. I'm brain farting on them. So they're the, they're the actual developers of the of the tech. But it's, in terms of the actual usage of it, I don't know. But uh, even upstairs, I've had a few people come up to me. They're like, oh yeah, I ended up grabbing a, 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 a like an Amazonic mix from somebody from like the 80s or 70s. But I I haven't I've never run into those, and I haven't really sought that out. It, it's just not because that's on me. So it doesn't mean that there's not that it didn't happen. But the, the question of like, can you take a yeah. Uh, like a stereo recording and, yes. uh, and essentially upmix it into some, in, into ambisonics. I get this question a lot. So when I have my rig set up, um, I get so I work typically right now. I'm working a lot with electronic. Um, so this 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 system works really well for electronic uh, like electronic music because you can do really weird fun stuff with surround, like things that are non-acoustic. It works great for classical t stuff too, where you're doing this, where you want the sense of envelopment. It works great for cinema, for things like rock and that kind of thing. Not so good, but um, so I deal with a lot with ele electronic artists and the by far and large the biggest one when DJs come up to me and they're like can I jump on I was like totally all you got to do is have all your stuff separated out they're like oh can I just use my stereo mix and you're like well you can so what it does is if you the way you think about it is your left speaker and your right speaker are just sound objects so you just have to decide where you want those are in 3d space so in terms of like splitting things up and, and, and up mixing them there's stuff you can do to um, like you know, frequency spreading and delays and some of this kind of stuff that that you can do to give it a pseudo sense of space. But to me, and to my audiophile or mastering ears, that's I don't like that kind of distortion. To me, that's that that removes from the original recording, unless you're working with the artists themselves to do that. But if you're working with the artists themselves, they have the original tracks, so you could probably um, remix that into a spatial format. So, in in essence, no, you can't really do that. I, I guess it's, it's yes and no. But you can take a multi-track recording. And that's exactly and what we want to do. So if we can get the multi-tracks, the original multi-tracks, or in some forms, at least something broken apart, then we can, because you think about each instrument or each track as a sound object. You think about where you want that thing to be in 3D space. And if you want that thing to be moving, or if you want, to, if you want it to be static in places, so if you want the kick there, and the snare there, and the vocals there, and the synth back here, and the, and the piano over there, you can certainly do that. Or you can have them moving around in there. And so it's, it's, it's a new territory. It literally adds another dimension to your creative palette. But it also, it's, it's, it's mind-bendingly difficult. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so much more difficult than you think it will be to decide on that because now all of a sudden you have to decide your artistic intent. Why do I want that there and the, the, the vocals over there? I mean, if you're doing something, say, like a classical, like a quintet recording in a beautiful hall, you're going to use the back as mostly as reverbs and reflections. But and what you don't want to hear is if it's a, like a live recording, you don't want to hear the person's sneezing behind you the whole time, <laughs> but you will get that, I mean, if, if, with, the, with this kind of setup. So um, it's, it's, it's crazy to see, and so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how people are going to start using these, like using this artistic decision. We've seen this for, in surround for a long time. Most, a lot of bands are putting out, and artists are putting out beautiful surround recordings, but the problem I see is that surround still is such a boutique. It's been around for like a long time, and it's, it's such a boutique format. So few people have really high-end 5.1 or 7.1 systems, or even Atmos systems now, that it's very difficult for the content creators to justify these incredibly complex mixes that barely anybody's going to listen to. Um, but I think with this system, it's now worth investing in creating these beautiful spatial mixes because it, it translates to any playback system. You only have to do it once. You're talking about the geometry of sound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oops, the, yeah the, <laughs> How are we doing on time? Anybody else? So I have one more. Sure. Um, if you look at some of the tech that's been, been come out, particularly from Google, there are a lot of speakers that can place themselves with respect to each other. Uh -huh. Do you think that kind of technology will help advance the usage of these style of recordings? Yeah, big time. Because the, the, for this magic trick to work, you have to know where the th speakers are in 3D space. And that's really tough to do, especially, uh, well, with normal. I mean, I have a little, like, uh, little laser angle thing that I use to figure out where the speakers are, but it only does in this axis. So figuring out where things are, the azimuth elevation and distance is a pain in the butt. It's really difficult to do. And so coming with an automated system that can do that, can figure out where those are, that, what is that but by increasing, by knowing where your speakers are, not necessarily in physical space, but where they are in acoustic space. Because where the speaker actually plays from, like if, you're, if you were listening to this speaker, you, you, you might be like, well, I mean, for us, it doesn't really matter. But if you're trying to get to the 
to the really high resolution of where that thing is. Is it coming from the tweeter? Is it coming from the woofer? Is it coming from both of them? And, and also the, the, with, with, with time delays, um, knowing where that speaker is to, to dial that in in 3D space really locks in your imaging. It gets much better. So the better you know where your, your speaker is, or even better, the speaker knows where itself is, that's, that's going to really accelerate and simplify things to make things a lot easier. And that's, I think, the, the, you're right, that's, it, it, to go a step further, making this stuff easy is, is a real a part of the thing. And that's one of the things I'm really working hard on, is trying to make this technology very simple to work with, so you're not having to set up a thousand wires and a thousand things. So, all right, well, I'm going to call it there, because we we're out of time now, but um, I, come up, Sarah's play. I, I'm going to set a play going for about another hour or so before I start tearing down, but I'll be up there um, in room 2030. Um, if you want to come down upstairs and play, we got some, like, it's mostly kind of DJ-ish. We have some, some synthesizers and some weird stuff to play with, but uh, feel free to hit me up anytime if you have any questions, but thank you for your time, guys.